was about, you know, years ago that, that I, I met my <laughs> I met my now wife, Britta, and it was 2011. And I, I remember vividly, you know, when you when you meet the person who you're genuinely interested in in that way, maybe, you know, some of you are, are dating, not yet married, um, you know, you, you, you get to know her, and, and I had no idea how she felt about me. I mean, odds are, I'm like, yeah, probably not, you know, but... But one can hope and one can dream. And so I remember going through all of these things that I would try to do to impress her. I wanted to be where she was. You know, we, we had this coffee shop. I lived in Hudson at the time. And that's back when Caribou was still there before, you know, the dark ages. Uh, I missed that place so badly. Now it's like a hippie juice bar. It just makes me mad. Right? But I remember she, she would always be working at that Caribou. She was a teacher at Western Reserve at the time, and so I, I would I would go there even when I didn't need to go there, just because I thought maybe she would be there, you know. <laughs> and I uh, found out later that she probably did the same thing, but I didn't know that at the time. I was just a dork trying to impress a girl that I thought was cute. But the point is, I would do everything I could. I would try to think activities. What is it that she likes to do? You know, I was she was a volunteer. I was a youth pastor, and so you know, I, I found opportunities as to why I needed her to be at events that she probably didn't even need to be at. But but I need your help so that you could be there. You know, you, you learn about her, you figure out what she likes, what she dislikes, and, and you're just trying to impress. Maybe you remember that. If you're married, maybe you've been married for 50 years, you try to remember back what you were like when you were trying to impress the guy or the girl, right? You would go through anything. Like, you th- I think back now, I'm like, not that we don't, you know, impress one another still, but I'm like, wow, man, that was a lot of work. Like, and she felt the same way, which to this day is still a miracle. I wake up in the morning every day going, I don't get it, but I'm not going to say anything. Right? And now we're married and we have a kid, and so we're parenting, and now you're stuck with me. I'm really sorry, by the way. But the point is, I think a lot of us, when we approach our prayer life, as we've been looking at this idea of prayer, that, that we think of that in some ways the same way. I think we... When we pray, when we think about what it means to pray, when we're seeking to grow in our lives of, of prayer, I think we, we try to impress. I, I think a lot of times we treat God as if we are you know, like newly dating <laughs> and, and trying to get him to like us. And so we, we worry about the eloquence of our words and we, we worry about, you know, we're talking about posture of prayer today, but I don't mean posture like kneeling or whatever. Yeah, but we worry about how we kneel or should we sit, should we stand, you know, is it okay? Now, if you ever pray with me in a circle, one of the things you'll notice is my eyes are never closed, and that's because I spent 10 years in youth ministry. I know better than to close my eyes in a circle of sixth graders. It doesn't matter if you're in prayer. They're just, it's just how I'm conditioned now. So I could be with our elders, and I'm going to be praying like this with my eyes open, looking down. So if I ever glance at you while we pray, it's not offensive. I'm not, like, not praying. You know, don't worry, your pastor is a Christian. <laughs> but, but we worry about those kinds of things. What do we look like? What do we sound like? You know, we talked about this a little bit last week. Just for recap, if you weren't here, if praying in front of people makes you terrifiedly nervous, raise your hand. See all the hands? There's a lot of hands. You're not alone. Let's just recap that. We're going to do that every week that we talk about prayer so that people know. If that's you, you are not by yourself. But we do. We want to impress and so we do these things and we worry about these things. And, and to some extent, that's a really bad way of approaching prayer. But there's some kind of goodness to it, too. Right? There, there are ways in which we, we should try to move and impress the Lord in, in terms of that. And so today we're going to look at, at some of this kind of approach. This approach has its flaws in some ways. But you are onto something. Because when it comes to the Lord and our relationship with him... There are things that we do. There are ways that we seek to impress him. Today, we're talking about the posture of prayer. Right? Last week, we talked about what it is. This week, we're talking about the posture. And the next week, we're actually going to get real practical on how to pray. Right? So that's kind of our three-step thing. And so when I say posture, I don't mean a physical posture. I don't mean, you know, the Lord doesn't listen to you more if you're on your knees or if your head is bowed in a certain way or if you, you, know, you fold like this versus like this. There's, there's no magical formula like this, but I mean a spiritual posture. Right? There are things that we can do that move us towards a closer relationship with the Lord that allow us to have a spiritual posture that is open for prayer to become more deep and more effective and more meaningful. Right? And so that's what we're talking about this morning. And it's the same thing with, with a dating analogy. There, is, there are things that I could do 
to make myself seem more impressive to Britta. I can't make her like me. Right? That, it's going to happen or it isn't. And so the difference where this breaks down is Britta and I are human beings. We're dealing with the God of the universe. Right? And so before we even get into any of these, of these things, real quickly I want to look at a verse in Romans 8 that kind of sets us up for the very beginning of the postures that we should have as we pray. So let's read this together. It says, So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoration or as a, of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Two things in here that help us when we seek to begin to examine a posture of prayer. Number one is this. It is by the Spirit that we are able to pray. Right? It is by him by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And so the first is this. When you're wondering, well, I'm not good at prayer. I don't know if I, am I doing it right? Am I the Spirit of God, when he brings us into his fold as, as heirs, he brings us in and he gives us his spirit. And that is what empowers us to be able to pray in the first place. And so if you're wondering, how do I begin? What's the, what's the posture? What's the secret? What are the things? The first thing to understand is this. We have a spirit that enables us to, to pray. That gives us a supernatural ability so that as we communicate with God, he hears us and we hear him. You are given that as a follower of Christ. When you accepted Christ, when the Lord drew you to himself and you accepted him as your Lord and Savior, he gave you his spirit and you are able to pray. And so how do I get the power? You already have it. Right? And the second is this. The word Abba in this passage is really significant. It's, it's not father. It says Abba, comma, father. But Abba is, in, in, in that word is much more of this kind of Papa type of language, right? It's, it's daddy, right? My two-year-old doesn't come up to me and say, Father, can I have a muffin? He says, Daddy muffin. <laughs> he demands. He doesn't ask it's in our house. We're getting to that part, right? But this, it's this intimate word to the point where the Jewish people actually weren't super fond of using that word because it was too, too homely in a way, too, too intimate for the God of the universe who is to be respected and adored, right? And so to call him daddy just seemed like something that shouldn't be done. But the reality is, if we look through scripture in the New Testament and in the Gospels, as Jesus goes about his ministry, he models over and over again this word Abba as he prays. And he gives the disciples permission to be able to do so as well. And so what, what is happening here is that Jesus is extending the benefits of his relationship with the Father as the Son of God He's extending that relationship to us. And so when we pray to God, we don't pray as a people who are removed from him. We don't pray wondering what he thinks about us. We don't pray wondering if he's going to be a good God today or if he's mad and got up on the wrong side of the bed. We pray to God as people who are told that we are sons and daughters. We don't call him by anything other than Father, Abba, Daddy. And so when we come to him, you have to understand, you're not coming to him in your prayers trying to earn somehow favor and affection. You're coming to a God who's already given it to you. Who says that you are his son and his daughter. And so what's the posture that we should have as we pray? We have a posture of adoption and of acceptance. And of empowerment by the Spirit. And so theologically, that's, that's what encourages us as we pray. We don't have to worry about whether we're polished enough or good enough or clean enough. We can come to him. Jesus says, I call him Abba Father. You, you can too through me. 
Right? You follow me in death, you follow me in life. And you get to be with God and be called his son and daughter as you pray. So that's, that's the theological framework as we talk about the posture of prayer that we ought to have. It's not a nervous, timid, worried posture. It's a confident, spirit-enabled, bold posture that we come to him as if he is our dad. We know that our dad has our best interest at heart. Right? So that when the Lord responds, if we pray and we ask for something and the Lord says no, it's not because he wants to be angry. It's because he's your, your Abba, your father, and he knows what's best for you. Right? So that's why God answers some prayers yes, some no, some later. Because he knows what's best for us even when we don't. So that's the theological framework. Well, what's the practical framework? Very simple. Throughout the history of Christianity, we have these things called the spiritual disciplines. Uh, this is not my idea. This is not unique to me. This is something that has been around for 100 years. And so as we go through it, you know, this isn't something that you could necessarily like copyright or even cite to some degree because it's, it's in the public domain of things. But we have, as Christians, what we call the spiritual disciplines. They're things that through Scripture we see that God instructs us to be partaking in, to do, and they are things that enable us to be more godly. Right? They're things that cause us to be more indebted with the Lord and to be more like him and to see him more. And so the Lord has given us, you know, how do I get closer? I feel distant from God. I feel like my relationship with God has been stale for five years. And I don't know what to do about it. The Lord gives us a, a roadmap and he gives us things that we are to do. If you want to read more about this, before we're going to get into all 12 of them today. But if you want to read more about this, there is no better book on this than The Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. In some ways, it's a heavy read, I warn you, but it is excellent. It is a beautiful treatment of all 12 disciplines. So I, I would commend that you would go home and that you would read that book. We may actually do a Bible study on it in the near future. I think that might be a great idea. But this morning, we're going to look at those disciplines. And we divide them into three different categories. And here they are. We have the inward disciplines. They're things that we practice internally. We have outward disciplines that we individually practice, but externally. And then we have what we call corporate disciplines. And these are things that we do as the body of Christ together. By the way, you are currently in worship, which means you are automatically covering number, you know, three, two, just by being here. Congratulations. You're already done with one of the disciplines for your, <laughs> never done, but you know what I mean. But here they are. They are meditation, prayer, fasting, study, simplicity, solitude, submission, service, confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. And for some of you that are trying to write really fast, on the way out your door, there's two little tables right there by those double doors as you exit the sanctuary. We've got them all written down with a little summary. You can take that home. Put it on your fridge. Remind yourself what each one of these is, right? But we're going to go through each one of these in a closer way and examine how they draw us closer to him. And so first, meditation. Meditation is simply this. It is taking time to reflect on the things that the Lord is teaching you and to practice listening to the voice of God. We as a culture are awful at this one. So bad. We wreck it. Here's from Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Here's why we're terrible at this. Because we have these magical little things. These magical little devices. <laughs> and every time you have dead space in your life, every single time there's just a shred of dead room that you have like three seconds, right? Whether it's going to the bathroom or waiting at the line in Panera or even in a drive through it doesn't matter. You're going to have that thing on you everywhere you go, right? What's the first thing you do when you're standing somewhere in line and you're waiting? That's what I do. I don't even know what I'm looking at half the time. I'm just like scrolling through my tiles, you know. But, but we on it. We fidget with our phones. We are constantly immersed in something. And so we, we really lack this ability to stop and meditate. And here's why this is so sad. We, as a, as a society, continue to absorb more and more information. You are hit with like 10 times as much factual information in a day than you were maybe two or three generations ago. And so you get all this stuff put inside your head, 
good or bad, doesn't matter. And you never actually take time to reflect and meditate and process those things. The Lord calls us to stop. Right? We have knowledge and then we have wisdom. Knowledge is having facts. Wisdom is knowing what to do with them. And one of the ways that we acquire wisdom is by meditating, by taking time to chew. Now, I'm not talking about some Buddhist, you know, sit in, sit in your Indian style, sit and just go, no. But we take time and we pause and we reflect on the things of the Lord and the days that we've had and what we do with some of the things that we've received. We read stuff and then we digest it. It's unbelievably important that we take time to just reflect and think throughout the day. And some of us, you probably have to schedule this time. You can use this. <laughs> Put it in your phone. If you notice, even some of the secular world is starting to, to get this idea. Now, they have it construed, and they take it, and they use it for their own advantage. But over the last few years, one of the things you've seen with, with companies like Apple and iPhones is they're introducing more and more ways to silence the mess. Just before church, I was, I was talking with our, our pianist, Julie, about the different ways that your phone can now like, have focus modes that disable certain notifications and keep things quiet for you automatically. And if you ever want to know how to set that up, I'll do a pastoral seminar on how to get your phone not to bother you. I'll be happy to do that. We'll sit in my office, and we'll just go through our settings together. Right? But the world is catching on. We have things like meditation apps now. What we understand as Christians is that that's because the Lord knows us and made us and understands that we are built by design to pause, to wait, to reflect, to meditate. And as you do that, as you get into the disciplined habit of just disconnecting for a little bit and spending some time just in your thoughts, you'll start to think of things and process things that you should be processing but that are maybe too uncomfortable and so you just ignore them and you drown them out with all the noise of the newest game or app or messaging thing or that, right? Like the newest social media platform, whatever it might be. We are called to be a people of pause and reflection and of meditation. Second, prayer. I will not spend much time on this because we're doing a whole sermon series on prayer. But it is one of the spiritual disciplines. And as we're talking about using these to enrich and deepen our prayer life, one of the things we have to see is that these disciplines help one another out. As you engage with some of them, you will find deeper engagement with others. You will start to notice that over time, you know, if you practice multiple ones of these, individually they start to become more natural and easier because they relate to one another. But this is a discipline, and it tells us something about, as a sneak preview for next week, what it actually means to pray, like the how-to. One of the things we, we learn as it being a discipline is that it's something that takes practice. Why am I not that good at praying? Well, do it more. Right. Someday when I'm missing, I will, I will put a video up of like the first sermon I ever preached, maybe, in college. And all of you will run and wire, wonder why they hired this guy as a pastor. <laughs> it was terrible, I can tell you. Every once in a while I listen to it. It keeps me humble. I'm like, my gosh, what were you doing? Right? Practice is what, what gets us there. And so prayer is in that same vein. Number two, fasting. This is a contentious one. How many of you have ever engaged in some type of fasting before? A lot less hands than the prayer, but a lot more than I thought. Okay, very cool. Fasting is something that our culture will probably look at as weird. And, and so there's just a few, few points I want to make on this. Number one, the point of fasting is not to starve yourself. It has actually very little to do with hunger, just like baptism has very little to do with just water being dumped on somebody. Right? It's, it's, it means something. It represents something. It stands for something. And so when we fast and when we go hungry, hungry throughout our day, that hunger reminds us to reflect and think about the Lord. Right? We, we fast intentionally in order that we might be reminded throughout the day to think about God. When I fast every once in a while, I, was, I will notice that you know, my stomach will gurgle and I'll be like, oh man, I'm hungry. Oh yeah. Why am I hungry intentionally? And the second is this. Fasting doesn't always have to be about food. Fasting really at the core is, like it says, going without something for a time in order to focus instead on God. A lot of us do this during Lent. A lot of us give up things. Who here has given up social media during Lent at some point? A couple hands, right? It would be a great practice. I would highly encourage you to do that. 
right? There are things in our lives that we can fast from for a time. They're not bad things, but we can fast from them for a time in order to focus on what's more important. Maybe you take a whole day. I know this is crazy, and I'm not harping on phones, I promise. It's just a great example that works in all these things. But maybe you take a day. When you go out for the day, just leave it at home. You'll feel naked and anxious the whole time. I guarantee you. I promise you. But just, just, just do it. Just for a day. And see if by the second half of the day, things just, just don't feel a little better and different. Right? I had a college professor who didn't have a cell phone. He was the only person on campus that I knew who didn't have a cell phone. And his thoughts were, I'm either in the office where I have a desk phone, or I'm at home where I have a house phone, or I'm somewhere where I don't want to talk to you. So I never got one. <laughs> Man, I wish I could live by that. We are called sometimes to, to forsake things that are good, to put them aside in order to leave more time to focus on him. And fasting is designed to do that. When we have very specific things that we're praying for, when we're coming up on some contentious points in our life or major decisions that we have to make, it helps sometimes to fast in order to cause us and remind us to reflect on him. Right? And so don't make this about, you know, well, I didn't make it all day. It's not about that. It's about the principle of the things. Right? The same way you're not baptized any less whether I drown you in a pool or sprinkle you. Right? It's what it stands for. It's what it spurs our hearts on towards that matters. And the last one, last one in the personal kind of individual disciplines here, study. Reading God's word and asking him for understanding. And we have 2 Timothy here. All scripture is God-breathed and useful. For what, though? For reproof and correction and instructions in righteousness. Over the next decade or more, however long I happen to be allowed to be your pastor here, you will hear me harp on getting into the word of God. You will get sick of me encouraging you to get into the word of God. But here's the reality, and we hinted at it last week. In prayer... One of the primary ways that the Lord speaks to us is through his word. If you ever come to me and say, I try to pray, but God just doesn't talk back. And you're not regularly engaged in reading of the word of God. Guess what I'm going to tell you to go home and do? He's given us his word. He's given us this massive volume that tells us about his nature and his call on our lives and how he wants us to live and what he wants us to do. Now, yes, does the Bible have an encyclopedia of all decision making? No. Can I tell you that if I want to decide whether to take or not take this job, page 64 will tell you? No. But we do have guiding principles. And so as you spend more and more time in the word of God, you learn more and more about his character and his nature and his desire and his will for your life. And as you then do that and pray, you will start to notice that in the midst of your prayer, scripture will start to come to your mind. In the midst of your despair, because you've lost somebody, or someone's hurting or sick, or you're hurting or sick, and you're praying for healing, You'll remember scriptures of encouragement. And you'll actually hear the Lord speak to you through those. Right? You'll hear things like, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you. Right? You'll hear those kinds of things, those encouragement pieces. But we have to be in the word of God. One of the damages of prayer is that we oftentimes talk way more than we listen and then when we're quiet and he doesn't just like come down and speak to us like he did to Moses, you know, we wonder, where are you, God? Well, he's in his word. He's given it to you. Read it. The response to most of your prayers are in that book if you spend time with it and engage with it. So those are the individual private disciplines. Here's some corporate ones. And you'll notice that there's an overlap, or not corporate ones, public ones. There's overlap between kind of the, the private and public sphere. Some of these are private, but also displayed in a public way, right? You can pray quietly to yourself. You can pray publicly. But simplicity, this one is really hard. The more stuff we have, both in terms of physical stuff and just things happening in our lives, right? The more we overcommit to a thousand different things, the more we do and the more we acquire, the harder it is for us to hear the Lord speak into the midst of our lives. One of the disciplines that God gives us is a discipline of simplicity. And Proverbs 11 says this, those whoever puts trust in his riches will wither. 
We put way too much faith into the things of this world. And so does this mean that you should go home and sell all you have? No, maybe for you particularly, but not generally for all of us. If we all sold everything we had, we'd all have to live here. And house guests are like fish. They stink after three days. Right? Use that at Thanksgiving when you, people come in. Don't use that for your family. We love all of our families, right? <laughs> but we, we have to think about the things that we put our trust in. And so simplicity is one of the ways that we can do that. I used to have a far more simple life before toddler toys entered my house. I was a very simple guy. I was very much a minimalist. And, you know, you go through ebbs and flows and phases of your life. Does that mean I'm going to go home today and throw out all the Graham's toys? No. But we should think about, are we just acquiring stuff to have it? Or could we maybe simplify it? Go home today and just look around your house. What are the things you really need? And how peaceful might it be to have some of those things be gone? One of my favorite shows used to be growing up was Hoarders. And part of why is I'd always like the end whenever everything was actually kind of done. You know, you just see, like, there's, there's a joy that comes with it, with simplicity. And we mean this with stuff, and we mean this with life. Some of you are overcommitted to a bajillion different things, and it's killing you inside. Now, I'm never one as a pastor to advocate not volunteering. As a matter of fact, when you leave here, go sign up for all the things that... But... but if you are in, in, in a situation of life where you're just so crazy that you can't find an ounce of rest, then don't sign up for those things. Take rest. Get rid of some of the things that you are doing. Simplicity is something that the Lord ordains for us to have. He calls us to think about what really is important, what truly matters, and to press into those things. And the only way that we have space to do that is if we clear out some of the gunk. Right? So all of us go home and have yard sales. Solitude. This goes along with the idea of meditation. But few of us are ever really alone. Now, some of you may be alone too much, and that's a tragedy, and you know, we hope that a church community is one of the ways that can fill those kinds of voids. So if you, if you are somebody who experiences a significant amount of loneliness, I'm not trying to belittle that at all, but for the most part, right, we are go, 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 and we're always with people. If we watch the ministry of Jesus... His earthly ministry, he radically, consistently, over and over and over again, made sure to spend time off by himself, right? He didn't just get up and pray in his bed before he walked out the door. He went off to some faraway place by himself to spend time with his father. We are called to spend time alone. A lot of times, this is where the Lord speaks and convicts. Right? And meditation and that go hand in hand, so there's some points I won't repeat. But it is important that we spend time in solitude. Right? It's good for us. I know my mom, every single year, multiple times, she has a cabin that she likes to go to. She just finds a cheap cabin that she can go stay with her dog and just be alone. No phone, no computers, no friends. Right? Just spend time by yourself. A lot of us are terrified at the idea of being by ourselves. Why? Spend some time on your own in meditation. Do it regularly, maybe an hour a week, just to be by yourself. You can find that time. If I can find that time with both Britt and I having a full-time job and a little kid, then you can too. Right? Put him to bed, spend some time, spend half an hour apart, and then come back together and talk about your day. Just to be by yourself, to decompress just a little bit, right? It's part of the discipline. Submission. Oh, now we're meddling. Hard. Submission is one of the hardest disciplines. Submission is this. It's practicing obedience to God and those that he's placed over you in spiritual authority. It's a discipline because it's immensely hard to do, but it does bring us closer. And, he, and here's how. I'll give you an illustration. I, I have a challenge not so much anymore, but growing up, I had a large challenge trusting men because the two father figures in my life, dad and stepdad, were very useless. They were awful people. They weren't, you know, one of them left us. The other was kind of verbally abusive. And so I, I didn't trust guys a lot. And so that was a hindrance for me when I started to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior and I was learning what it means. Like when I think of Abba Father, I don't get good images in my head. Right? And so that took some level of overcoming. And so for me to even submit myself to some figure of that nature was not even fathomable. 
And so this, for me, as an, as an early on, as a young Christian, was incredibly difficult. How dare there be a God who tells me what to do and how to live my life and what choices I should make and who I should and shouldn't spend time with and what I should or shouldn't do with them. But here's what I found over and over again. When we submit things to the Lord and we obey and we do it his way, he is faithful to us. And for me, this was a really hard, long thing. And so it started with very small things. You know, everyone's, all right, I'm going to trust you with this tiny thing. If it doesn't work out, I'll still be okay. You know, I'm not fully reliant, but I'm a little bit, and, and it would work out, and I would build trust over and over again. You know, he is the one Abba Father who has yet to let me down. And so the discipline of submission is that we slowly start to say, I'm going to hand things to the Lord that I don't want to hand to the Lord. Start small. I guarantee you, as he's faithful, you'll be encouraged to submit more and more of your life to him. This is what sanctification is. It's the gradual handing over of every facet of our life to Christ. No one becomes a Christian and then wakes up the next morning and has turned over their entire life to him. Never happened, promise you. As a matter of fact, one of the detrimental things that we do as a church with new Christians is we expect that they're going to be that way. Right? You bring someone to church, they hear a couple sermons, they decide that they want to do this whole Jesus thing, you, know, you pray with them, and the next morning or the next Sunday when they come to church and they're still dressed the same and still thinking the same and still acting the same, you, you scratch your head, what is going on? Well, it takes time. Justification happens the instant we accept him, but sanctification is lifelong. Right? The moment you become a follower of Christ, you will spend every minute of every day, of every week, of every year of your life growing slowly more and more into his likeness. And submission is how we practice that. We give him little, and he is faithful. And so we give him more, and he's still faithful. And eventually, we get to the point where we trust him with all of it. It takes time, but we have to practice that as a discipline. Service. This one should be pretty obvious to people. Right? If then our Lord and teacher has washed our feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. The Lord modeled in every moment of his ministry on this earth service to the least of these. And so we are called as a discipline to be serving others. We have to be caring for the least of these. This isn't a choice. This isn't something that those six or seven people in the church do every time something comes up. We as the body of Christ should be actively engaged in serving. One of the things your missions and outreach committee is doing right now is talking to some ministries in this area, a few key ministries, to, to see how we as a church can become actively involved in service. How we can revamp our missions so that we can be known as a place that makes a dent in this community. So we're talking to places like Rahab Ministries and saying, how can we really invest here? We are called as God's people to serve. And again, I won't stress the sign-up sheet, but there's some ways to serve. If you're wondering, well, how do I get started? <laughs> we'll provide you ways. But we are called to be people that serve. We have to be. The founder of the Pittsburgh Project, it's an inner city ministry for kids in Pittsburgh. It's massive. It now like, sends the people to college. It kind of is like, I promise, but he's not good at basketball, Right? Like it started as this little thing, but it's now there, there's a school and tutoring and, and all kinds of wonderful things that are happening. And the, the founder of that is a guy named Salim Gabriel. And Salim used to say this. He said, if you want to see Jesus, just go serve somebody. And that's true. How many of you have been on a mission trip? Adults, youth, I don't care. Mission trip. How many of you feel like that was the most mountaintop experience of your life when it came to your Christian faith? Why? Because you're designed to be a people who serve one another. And so when you go spend a whole week and you do that, guess what? That's what life as a Christian is supposed to be like. And so you feel at home. We are called to be people that serve. And when we engage in service, we come closer into contact with God. We get to experience him more. We get to be dwelling with him more. We serve together. Confession. Why do you think we get up on Sunday mornings? We've added this since I've been your pastor. We have a confession of sin every single morning in worship. It's not because we're starting to become Catholic, don't worry. 
Right? Same reason we're not having an Apostles' Creed or some kind of creed of faith after the sermon's done. It's not because we're trying to become Catholic, but it's because it's what we're called to do. When we get together as the body of Christ, what are we to do? We are to worship him. We are to hear from his word. We are to confess our sins together. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We are called as a discipline to be a people that regularly think through and confess our specific sins to the Lord. And we do this individually in the midst of our times of prayer, but we do this corporately as the body. That's why we have a confession of sin. If you ever wonder, why do I make you stand up and repeat in unison together? Because we are a church that acknowledges that we are sinners in the sight of God in need of his grace and his mercy that he purchased for us on the cross And that's who you are. That's your identity. Apart from Christ, you are a degenerate sinner who's capable of nothing. We confess that to him regularly. And we ask him to not just forgive us, but to allow us to repent and to move forward in a new way. Right? That's what confession is all about. Worship. Congratulations. You checked that box today. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This one's a little contentious in the world we live in today, because here's one of the things that happens. And if this is you, I'm really sorry. I'm going to call you out. People at home. COVID has made us comfy. How many of you got real used to the idea of church in your PJs over the year 2020? Sitting on the couch with your favorite cup of coffee, right? Wasn't that great? Our staff jokes still to this day. One of, the, one of the joys was sitting at home on our own sofas at Christmas Eve, watching the service that we had created, and, and just being able to be in my PJs. You know, watching myself preach was a little awkward, but it was kind of neat. Like, Christmas Eve is like the most stressful time of church staff's life. We were all just at home, relaxed with our families. But you get comfortable in that idea. Now, I'm not saying if you are somebody who is homebound, if you have a a reason, if you have some kind of health condition that COVID is particularly concerning to you, I'm not trying to get into the politics of COVID and fear and should you be with people or not. But one of the things I will encourage you is think about, if you're not regularly here, think about the motivations. If you say, well, I'm worried about COVID, well, but then you have a house party with 30 people. Guess what? <laughs> it doesn't add up. And I promise you, this is one of those things where afterwards I'm like, you were talking to me. No, I'm not, I have no specific person in mind. I swear that to you. <laughs> I promise you that. But it is important to understand we are called as God's people to not neglect meeting together. There is something pedagogically that happens When we come together as the people of God, physically, in presence, with one another, we see each other's faces, we stand shoulder to shoulder, and we sing to one God together in worship, and we praise him, and we confess to him, and we hear from his word, and then we engage about that word, and we go off into our own coffee circles afterwards, and we talk about things of life and of the church. Those are important things. We should be a people that regularly meets together. Do you know the average Christian statistically today, attends church about half the time. Like the average committed Christian is in church two weeks a month. That's terrible. I'm just going to say it. I'm not saying that because I'm a pastor who wants to pad the church attendance. That's not what it's about. But we are called to be together. That's why 2020 was so devastating. Because for almost a year, we couldn't be together. I will never forget the first day that we were back in person when COVID ended. We got to stand here and not preach to an iPhone. There was, it was like an iPhone right here that I, would, that I would speak to every once in a while. And that stunk. And the joy and the life and the vibrancy that came when we gathered physically as God's people. Worship has probably never been so loud in this sanctuary as that day. It was wonderful. We are called to be in worship together. And we practice that as a discipline. Guidance. As iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. One of the disciplines is that we get with people in the church, with Christians that we know and love, who have walked with him longer than we have, who have a maturity in their faith, and we purposefully put those people in our lives and we sit under them and we allow them to shape us. This is incredibly important. Every one of you 
right? We look at the, the, the ministry of Paul and Barnabas and how, how he poured into him. Every one of us should have a Paul. And as you grow in your faith, every one of us should seek a Barnabas. If you think the primary way that people grow in Christ is to just sit in a pew and listen to the pastor drone on every single week, that's not it. Where the real growth happens, where the real life change happens, is in one-on-one relationships. And if you, I bet if you think about the people who have been most influential in your faith, maybe it's a pastor, but it's not necessarily, well, I got to sit every week and hear that guy preach. It's because they were invested in you and speaking through things with you. And you could call them in the middle of the week and show up at their office and have a cup of coffee and work through things. Or you had that, that brother or sister in Christ in the church that you grew up in that, you know, that constantly was engaging with you. Part of why we gather is so that we can be guidance to one another. You will be better off in your walk with Christ because of the people that are in this room. And I guarantee you, you can look around, unless this is your first week, (laughs) in some way, people in this room have shaped you. You're different because of them. We have men and women who have been together in the same Bible studies for years. And they're in each other's lives each other's messes. I have people that I know that will call me out, that will talk to me, that will walk me through things. And I them. Such an important discipline. If you don't have those people, come, please come talk to us. We will set you up with brothers and sisters in Christ who will walk with you. We have men and women in this church who are gifted in that type of work, who would love nothing more than to come alongside of a younger Christian. I'll buy the lunch. Within reason. It's not like a blank check. (laughs) All of a sudden I get like a $6,000 church lunch bill from people. But we need to be a people that guide one another. And here's the last one. And it's a little weird, but celebration. We are called to engage with fellowship within our Christian community. And we are called to celebrate what God has done in our midst. We as a church, this is one of the areas where in the year 2020, I'm going to push us hard to grow. <clears throat> We're going to start to see more things like stories of God's goodness in the midst of our church and testimonies and the way that God has been at work. Because here's the reality. We need to have those things in our life so that when the hardship comes, we have them in, the, in our life. When struggle hits, we need to know and and remember all the ways that God has been at work. We need to have it drilled into our minds that we serve a God who is working and living and active and breathing. So when we go through times of drought, we can remember that. I've said this before, the number one reason why people abandon their faith is because some tragedy hits and they say something like, well, a loving God would never do this to me. I'm done with him. Why? Because in the darkness, they have forgotten how good God is. I would encourage you to do this in any way you can. As a church, we are called to celebrate. And as a church, we will start to do that more and more. But as individuals, start to write things down. Maybe you're not a journal guy. I don't care how you do it. You do not have to have the fancy journal that you see on Pinterest. Right? Pull up a notes app in your phone. God is at work. Anytime something happens, just type it in. It doesn't matter, but keep track of the way that God is working in your life so that when you fall on hard times, you can come back And look at those things and remember. We ought to be a people that celebrate. As a church, this means that we're a people that come together. It's important to come together. One of the primary ways that church health exponentially grows is by people just being together in fellowship. That's why we do stuff like next week where we deck the halls together. Our church staff could decorate this church with with a few of us probably in like an hour or two. I'm pretty confident. We were pretty, pretty banging church staff. We could knock it out. Why don't we do that? Because it's so much better to have all of us gather together, to do things together, to laugh as a tree falls on one of us. Right? Hopefully no one falls off the giant ladder. Our tree, for those who haven't been here, is like up to the, you know, it's pretty high when it comes out. But we do that together. We decorate together. We decide where things go. We think, oh, maybe we should put that here this year. That'd be cool. We, 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 we see the beauty of Christmas come alive within our, our, our house, within God's house. We share food together. We eat together. We, we watch silly Christmas movies together. In Fellowship Hall, as we set up tables to decorate cookies and just have fun and be together. We do that because that's what brings life and vibrancy to the body of Christ. Right? And by the way, 
That's what people who don't know him really crave, is community. One of the number one reasons that people will tell me why they stay in a church is because when they come, they find community. Right? If you want a list of churches that proclaim the word of God, I can give you a list. Right? When I was in college, I had to do this exercise, and I won't name the name of the church, but we had to do a church evaluation. It was a ministry class that you, know, you evaluate kind of how churches function. And so you had to go to a church that you'd never been to, and you had to fill out all these rubrics, you know, like, what was it like when you were greeted? What was the experience walking in the door? You know, it's like the ultimate visitor survey kind of thing. Uh, and then I had to write, like, a 20-page paper on it. And so I went to a church in, in, in Pittsburgh where I was living at the time. And I went the day that they had opened their brand-new $6 million welcome atrium. <laughs> and my blood boiled because I walked in and it was like, you know, welcome, new atrium. And it showed, like, the fundraising goals and all those kinds of things. I'm like, God, the mission we could do was $6 million. Like, if you handed Stowe Press $6 million right now, it would be life-changing for the next 50 years, probably. It would, it would blow our minds what we could do with that. And here's the irony. I came 40 minutes early because I was doing an assignment. I came in, and I walked to all the different places, and I was walking around. I purposefully was, you know, walking near where there was crowds of people. There'd be, like, four or five people from the church talking, and I'd kind of walk up towards them and keep walking. And I, in 40 minutes before the service in the $6 million Welcome Center, was not welcomed one single time. <laughs> I left. I would have never come back to that place. Why? Because I, I, in, the, in the midst of a church of like 4,000 people, I didn't, there was no community. People didn't know each other. Now, I'm not harping on large churches that by any means. I'm not trying to get... You know, large churches are great. But, but the point is this. As a church, we are called to be together, to celebrate together, to love together, to hurt together, to pray together, to be goofy together, to serve together, right? and to celebrate the way God is at work. Now, what do we do with this, this whole discipline thing? <clears throat> here's, here's what we don't do. The disciplines are not the 12-step program. Right. What do I have to do to get closer to God? All right, this week I'm going to make sure I serve somebody. Check. I pray. Check. All right, I spent 10 minutes alone. Check. If that's how we approach these things, they're not going to grow you. They're not going to shape you. It's not a program that we go through one at a time until we can check all 12 off of our to-do list. But on the other hand, we tend to swing the pendulum the other way too. There is value in what I would call the pedagogy of the motions. There's a reason God gives us these disciplines, and there's a reason he calls them disciplines. It's not because it's like punishment, like disciplinary, but they're things that we do <clears throat> that may be hard to do, that may be awkward to do, that may feel unnatural or uncomfortable to do, but if we do them faithfully over and over again, they become habitual. And that's the point of spiritual disciplines. It's that as we practice them, at first we might even do it begrudgingly. You might have an hour of solitude and you might hate every minute of it. Well, next week you'll hate it a little less. And a little less and a little less. And you'll start to practice the presence of God more and more and it'll be unbelievably awkward at first, but less so later and less so later. And I promise you, if you engage with these things, if you take these things and you start to commit to regular practice of some of these things, he will use them to shape you. And it will invigorate your prayer life. Because you will feel and draw closer to the God who made you, who loves you, and who saves you. And then the final thing is this, just before we close. These things do not save you. They do not cause God to look at you more favorably. They don't cause him to love you more if you do them or love you less if you don't do them. Right? That's why we started with Romans. The very basis, the very basis of our approach to things like the spiritual disciplines is that we are coming to a God who already saved us as Christians, who loves us and who says, call me Abba Father. Right? We're not trying to earn anything from these. We're trying to look at the God who made us, who loves us, who cares for us deeply, and say, how do I get closer to you? 
How do I bring thanks and gratefulness to you? How do I offer more and more of myself to you? How do I become more like you? And his answer is, engage in these things. Start to do them. So that would be my challenge to you today. My challenge would be that as you walk out, you grab one of those sheets of paper, you take them home, and you start to reflect on these and see which one of these things are you really kind of not engaging with at all. Right? A lot of us are going to be better at some than others. Right? Solitude this is just hard for me. It is. I remember as a junior hire being on a retreat. They had like the 20 minutes of silence. And I'd sit on some tree stump and go, what am I supposed to do? Right? That's okay. <laughs> if that's you, don't feel awkward. That's okay, I promise you. Right? But if you engage in these things and if you keep them and if you're steady in your practice of the disciplines of God, he will move you and he will grab you and he will bring you into a closer and deeper relationship with you. He will discover who he is through his word. You will see the nature of God unfolding in your life. <clears throat> and it will set you up in such a way that as you seek, as we next week look at, what does it actually mean to pray? How do we pray well? What are some principles that we can apply and practice in our own lives? It puts you in a state of readiness. It's a great pastor in Texas named Matt Chandler. He has the analogy of the faucet. I might have used it before. Right? We can't cause the Lord to pour his spirit out upon us, but we can get under the faucet. We can do things to get ourselves underneath there so that when he opens that faucet up, we get soaked. That's what these are. Right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the tangible ways that you give us to be closer to you. Lord, from the very moment that sin entered the world and you banished Adam and Eve from the garden, mankind has been trying to get back to God. And so you have enabled us over and over again to do that. You've sent your son to die for our sins, to redeem us, to purchase us back so that we can stand in right relationship with you. And then you've given us ways to grow into your likeness. And we thank you. We thank you for prayer. We thank you that you've created a means of, of us communicating with the God and creator of the universe. We thank you that you institute service, that you make sure that the least of these in this world are cared for by your command to go out and be people of service and of kindness and of mercy ministry. We thank you for those times in our quiet that you speak to us, that you comfort us, either through your spirit or directly through your word that we have encouragement. We thank you for your word. We thank you that <clears throat> unlike most faiths out there, we don't have to wonder what you're like. We, we know. We can know you. beautiful that is. So Lord, we pray as God's people that we might seek your face more. We pray for each and every one of us as we go out, as we engage with these, these disciplines that you've given us, that they might draw us into deeper and closer relationship with you, our Abba Father. Be with us as we continue in our 21 days of prayer, as we pray for this church and its leaders and the decisions that you would guide us into the, the church that you want us to be, that you would move us in the direction you want us to go. Thank you for the fact that you love us and that you're with us, that you sent your son to die for us so that we might be able to be in your presence eternally. We love you and praise you. And all his people said, Amen.